la Asamblea escuchará un discurso del primer ministro de la República Islámica de Pakistán, Su Excelencia Imran Khan. Pido protocolo que acompañe a Su Excelencia. Tengo el gran placer de dar la bienvenida al señor Primer Ministro de la República Islámica de Pakistán, a quien invito a dirigirse a la Asamblea General. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Iya karabudu wa iya kanastain. Mr. President, Honorable Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I feel honored today to represent my country at this Forum of World Leaders, where we have a chance to discuss problems that the world is facing. I want to talk about a lot of problems, but just four today. And I especially came to, to this forum despite a difficult time in my country facing challenges. I would not have come, but because I feel that there are some very urgent problems which the world must address. So first of all, I start with climate change. So many leaders have talked about climate change. But Mr. President, I feel that there is a lack of seriousness. Perhaps world leaders do not, some of the leaders who can do a lot, do not realize the urgency of the situation. We have a lot of ideas, but as someone said, ideas without funding is mere hallucination. Pakistan, I'll give you an ex start with my own country. Our country is amongst the top 10 nations in the world which are most affected by climate change. We depend upon our rivers. We are mainly an agricultural country and 80% of the water in our rivers comes from our glaciers. The glaciers not just in, on the Pakistani side, even India. The river in the 80% of the water in Ganges and the Indian uh, rivers also comes from the glaciers, from the Himalayan glaciers, Karakuram, Hindu Kush. And these glaciers are melting at a quite a rapid pace. We detected already 5,000 glacial lakes in, in our mountains. And if this keeps going, if nothing is done, we are scared that they, we are, humans are facing a huge catastrophe. In my country, when my party came to power in the province of KP, we planted a billion trees in five years. Now we've set ourselves a target of 10 billion trees in Pakistan. Idea being to counter this, the effects of global warming. But one country cannot do anything. This has to be a combined effort of the world. My optimism comes from the fact that humans the Almighty has uh, endowed humans with great powers. We can do anything, provided our survival instinct is stirred up. And this is really what I hope that the United Nations will take a lead in this. There must be more emphasis. Richer countries must be pushed countries that are responsible for, mainly are responsible for 
greenhouse gas emissions. They must be pushed because our country has, contributes minuscule amount to greenhouse gases. So uh, I feel that the United Nations must take leadership in this. My second issue for me right now is even more critical. Mr. President, every year, billions of dollars leave the poorer countries and go towards rich countries. Billions of dollars siphoned off by the ruling elites of the developing world. And they find their way into Western bank accounts, offshore accounts, tax havens, expensive properties hidden behind companies bought in Western capitals. Mr. President, this is devastating the developing world. This is causing more poverty, deaths. It's impoverishing the developing world. The difference between rich and poor countries is growing because of this. Money laundering, which happens because money leaves the poorer countries into rich countries, is not treated the same as, for instance, money from drugs or terror financing. The seriousness which terror financing and money from drugs, the way it is treated, it's not the same. The way the poor countries are being plundered by their elites, it's not happening. In my country, when my when I took uh, uh, charge of our government a year back, in the 10 years preceding that, our total debt went up four times. The debt we had accumulated in 60 years, just in 10 years, it went up four times. As a result, the total revenue we collected in one year, half of it went into debt servicing. How are we going to spend money on our human beings, 220 million people, when half the money is going into debt servicing? Because our country was plundered by the elites, the ruling elite. And the easily they could get the money out. And when, when, Mr. President, we located properties, in Western capitals bought by this money through corruption and money laundering, located the properties of these uh, corrupt leaders, we find it so difficult to retrieve it. That money, if we retrieved that money, we could spend on our human beings. But they are such, it's so difficult. The laws protecting these criminals We do not have the sort of money to have expensive lawyers and spend millions and millions of dollars. We need help from the rich countries. And Mr. President, it's critical. The, the rich countries must show political will. They cannot allow this to happen. How can, how can the poor countries spend money on human development, which the United Nations asks, SDG. How are we going to do it when this money can easily leave our countries? So, unless the rich countries intend to build walls to stop economic refugees coming, as we see right now, they must take action. They must take action now. We, they, it must be a deterrent. Ru corrupt ruling elites should not be able to take money out easily and park it into foreign bank accounts and into these properties abroad. And, and I never understand why. Why do we have these tax havens? Why is this allowed? Why shouldn't rich people pay taxes? Why is it legal to save, have these tax havens where you have these secret accounts? Because, you know, the world is changing. The, the population of the world is growing. Sooner or later, you're going to have a crisis. If the poor get poorer and the rich get richer, 
there is going to be a crisis sooner or later. So this is my second point. I hope that the United Nations takes a lead in this. It involves the IMF, the World Bank, Asian Development Bank. They must find a way of stopping this plunder of the developing world. My third point. My third point is Islamophobia. There are 1.3 billion Muslims in this world. There are millions of Muslims living in, in other countries, European countries, in the US, as minorities. Islamophobia, since 9-11, has, has grown at a pace where it is alarming. Human communities live together. They should be understanding amongst them. But Islamophobia is creating a division. Muslim women wearing hijab, it's become an issue. It's become an issue in some countries. Hijab is some sort of a weapon. A woman can take off her clothes in countries, but she can't put on more clothes. How is this happening? Because of Islamophobia. And where, how did this Islamophobia start? After 9-11. And why did it start? Because certain Western leaders equated terrorism with Islam. Islamic terrorism. Radical Islam. What is radical Islam? There is only one Islam. And that is the Islam we follow of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no other Islam. Radical Islam, Islamic terrorism, what message did they send to people in the West? And why is there Islam uh, Islamophobia? How is a person in New York, in the Midwest, in the US, in European capital, how is he going to distinguish between who is a moderate Muslim and who's a radical Muslim? Because terrorism has nothing to do with any religion. This Islamic terrorism, Islamic radicalism, and sadly used by leaders, this has been the main reason for this Islamophobia. And it has caused pain amongst Muslims. We in Muslim countries watch this Islamophobia traveling abroad, and it's getting worse. And may I just say, Mr. President, that in European countries, it is marginalizing Muslim communities. And we all know that marginalization leads to radicalization. Some of the people who ended up as militants in Syria and other places were from marginalized Muslim communities. And my point here is that we must address this issue. I'm sad to say that we Muslim leaders have not addressed this issue either. After 9-11, when this thing came about war against radical Islam, rather than Muslim leaders trying to explain to the West that there is no such thing as radical Islam, in all human communities, they are radicals. They're liberals and rest are moderate. All human communities. Christians, Jews, everyone has it. But Islam is not radical. Neither Judaism, neither Christianity, neither Hinduism. No religion preaches radicalism. All, the basis of all religion is compassion and justice, which differentiates us from animal, the animal kingdom. But unfortunately, the Muslim leadership was so scared of being called radical Islam that all of them became moderates. In Pakistan, we, we were in the eye of the storm, and our government coined a phrase called enlightened moderation. No one knows what it meant, but everyone started putting on Western suits that they were moderates, started speaking. Even those who didn't know English would speak English because they were moderates. No one had a clue what it was, because we, in the Muslim world, 
did not explain to the West that there is no such thing as radical Islam. Uh, one of the reasons why after 9-11, Islam was supposed to be uh, equated with terrorism was suicide attacks. Because the 9-11 bombers did a suicide attack, all sorts of theories came up that the Muslims uh, uh, are involved in suicide attacks because they will get virgin in heavens. Some came up with, what about women? Suicide attackers. So this bizarre thing happened. We no one explained. Suicide attacks and Islam came, came, were equated. No one did research that before 9-11, the majority of suicide attacks in the world were by Tamil tigers, who were Hindus. No one blamed Hinduism, and quite rightly. What has Hinduism got to do with what desperate people were doing in Sri Lanka? We all know about, we've seen films about Japanese kamikaze pilots at the end of the Second World War doing suicide attacks. No one blamed the religion. But here we were, uh, trying to prove we were moderates and not explaining to the West. But the most important thing I wanted to say here today uh, in explaining this uh, Islamophobia, Mr. President, and I feel it's very important because I've spent, because of, uh, I played professional sport in England, I spent a lot of time there. So I know how the Western mind works and how West views religion. So how, where the mis misunderstanding about Islam came. And it ha it, one of the reasons it caused Islamophobia. That was, in 1989, this book was published, maligning, insulting, ridiculing our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And there was a reaction in the Muslim world. The West couldn't understand what was the problem. Because in the West, because I have spent so much time in the West, religion is perceived completely differently. They don't, they don't look upon religion like we do. And so, Islam was supposed to be an intolerant religion. It was against freedom of expression. And Islam took a rail beating 30 years ago. I still remember it became a watershed. And every two or three years, someone would malign a prophet, peace be upon him. There would be a reaction by the Muslims. And again, it was Islam, an intolerant religion. Again this time, I, I blame a certain section of the uh, people in the West who deliberately provoked this, knowing the impact it would have. But the majority of the people in the West didn't understand. This is where, again, Muslim leadership let the Muslims down. We should have explained to them what a prophet, peace be upon him, meant, means to us. So in one minute, I'll try and explain what he means to us. A prophet was the witness to the divine book, the Holy Quran. The Holy Quran is the book of guidance for Muslims, and the prophet's life was living the Quran. He was an example of what the Quran guided us to be. So he is the ideal we all try to get to. The Prophet created the state of Badina, the first state in Islam. That state was the basis of a Muslim civilization which became the predominant civilization for the next 700 years. And what was that state? I hear such strange things about Islam, that it is against women, it's against minorities. The first state of Islam in Medina, most, it was the first time a welfare state was set up. The state took responsibility of the weak, widows, orphans, poor people, handicapped, it taxed the rich, spent the money on the poor. The state announced that all human beings 
are children of Adam, hence equal. Whatever the color of the skin, the state announced, the prophet announced that and slave, slavery, the whole system depended on slavery as it did for many years uh, in the Western societies. The prophet said that one of the greatest deeds is to free a slave. But it, because the society depended on, on slavery, he said, but if, but if you have to treat them as an equal member of the family. And as a result, something happened in a Muslim world which still hasn't happened in any other civilization. Slave dynasties appeared. Slaves became kings. The Mamluks, slaves who became ruled Egypt. In India, there were slave dynasties. And then, with minorities, again, you hear that Islam in, uh, is supposed to be against minorities. Let me just make this clear. In Islam, the Prophet announced that everyone was free to practice his religion. It was a sacred duty to, 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 to protect the places of worship of all religions. He announced that every person is equal in front of law, whatever his religion or his color. And this, this incredible case, and I always quote this, that the fourth Khalifa, the head of state of Medina, he lost a case, a court case, against a Jewish citizen. So number one, it showed there was a rule of law. No one was above law. And number two, that a Jewish citizen was an equal citizen. So, Mr. President, when a Muslim society is unjust to its minorities, it is going against the religion of Islam and our Prophet, peace be upon him. So, it is important to understand this. The Prophet lives in our hearts. When he's ridiculed, when he's insulted, it hurts that as we human know, we human beings understand one thing, the pain of the heart is far, far, far more hurtful than physical pain. And that's why the Muslims react. And I always thought that if I ever had the stage, I would try and explain this to, uh, to the world community, especially to the Western community, because having lived in the Western community, people didn't understand this. When I first went as a teenager to, uh, to England, there was a there was a comedy film on Jesus Christ. It's unthinkable in Muslim societies. So uh, we need to explain that, look, in a human community, we must be sensitive to what causes pain to other human beings. We have, in the Western society, and quite rightly, the Holocaust is treated with sensitivity because it gives the Jewish community pain. That's all we ask, that when do not use freedom of speech to cause us pain by insulting a holy prophet. That's all we want. And now the number fourth point, Mr. President, and this is the most critical point, is the reason why I especially came here. It is about what is happening in Kashmir. Before this, before I go on this, I want to make one thing clear, that when we came to power, my first priority was that Pakistan would be a country which will, which will try its best to bring peace we had been through this war on terror. We joined the United States war on terror after 2001. And Pakistan went through one of its worst periods where 70,000 Pakistanis died and over 150 billion was lost to our economy. And Mr. President, 
I opposed the war because in the 80s, Pakistan had joined the Western countries in what was the freedom struggle then in Af Afghanistan against the Soviets. And it was funded by the Western countries. These Mujahideen groups, which were treated in guerrilla warfare, were trained by Pakistan army, funded by the Western countries, and especially US, and they waged what was a freedom struggle in Afghanistan. The Soviets called them terrorists. We called them freedom fighters. 1989, the Soviets retreated. The Americans packed up and left. Pakistan was left with these groups. Come 9-11, Pakistan joined the United States in this war on terror. And now a government was supposed to, the, re the reason why I opposed joining this war, because here we had indoctrinated them in jihad, meaning freedom struggle against foreign occupation. Now, because we had joined the US and the US had occupied Afghanistan, now we were supposed to tell them that no, this is not freedom struggle and jihad, it's terrorism. So that's why I, I tried to tell then uh, uh, government that you know, stay neutral because you will have leverage over them. You will be able to control them, but if you join them, you become collaborators and they will attack you, which is what happened. They turned against us. We went through a nightmare. 70,000, 70,000 people killed in a war we had nothing to do with. No Pakistani was involved in 9-11. Uh, uh, Taliban were in Afghanistan. Al-Qaeda was in Afghanistan. What had we to do with it? 70,000 Pakistanis died. So when we came to power, we decided that we would dismantle what was left of these groups. And this decision was taken not just by us, but by all the political parties in Pakistan. Unfortunately, they didn't implement it. So we came to power, we decided to implement it, and we dismantled whatever was left of the groups. And I know that India keeps accusing us that there are these groups there. I would like the United Nations to send observers, see for themselves what we've done. No Pakistani government would have dared to do this because it would have created strife. But we decided that there would be no militant organizations in Pakistan. So I need to give you this background and to what I'm going to say later on. And secondly, we started mending fences. I invited the Afghan president. We developed a relationship with, the, with Afghanistan. We had problems with Iran. We mended fences there. And then India. Now let me just uh, give you a little background about my relationship with India. Because of cricket, and cricket being uh, one of the, it's a passion in the subcontinent, I had great following in India. I had great, I, I have friends in India. And I, I loved going to India. So immediately, when my party came to power, the first thing we did was to immediately reach out to India. And I spoke to President Modi and I said, look, we have similar problems. Climate change, poverty, let's get together. Let's resolve our differences through trade. Let's build a relationship on trust. Prime Minister Modi told me that, you know, there were terrorist attacks from Pakistan. I said, we have problems with you. There are terrorist attacks, which we know are instigated from, uh, by India in Balochistan. We caught a spy, Kalbushan Yadev, who admitted what, was, what the sabotage going on in Karachi and Balochistan. So we said, look, let's leave that behind. Let's move forward. Our main priority should, should be our people. The highest number of poor, poor people live in the Indian subcontinent. Unfortunately, didn't make any headways. Our foreign minister was supposed to meet on this uh, in the UNGA last year. India canceled it. 
We thought that it's their election coming up. It's a nationalist, ultra-nationalist party. It doesn't want to cozy up to Pakistan. So we, we thought, OK, we'll wait till the elections. Meanwhile, a 20-year-old Kashmiri boy whose father said was radicalized by the security forces in Kashmir blew himself up on an Indian convoy. Immediately, we, uh, India blamed us. I, I spoke to the Indian public on television. I said, if you give us any iota of uh, proof, we will immediately take action because we've clamped down on these groups. Rather than sending us any proofs, they sent their jets in, they bombed us. We retaliated. A jet, two of the planes were shot down, one pilot bailed out in Pakistan. We immediately ret returned the pilot, saying that, look, we do not want any e escalation. Rather than taking that as a peace gesture, the entire campaign, almost the entire campaign of Mr. Modi in the election was how he had taught Pakistan a lesson that they had jets had killed 350 terrorists. Complete lie. They had just killed about 10 trees of ours, which was quite painful given that you know we are growing all these trees. Uh, he then. The election campaign, Mr. Modi used words like, this is just a trailer. The movie is about to start. We will, I went into Pakistan and taught them a lesson. This was the election campaign. OK, so we thought, you know, us politicians make all these statements to win elections. So OK, after elections, we'll get back to our normal relationship. Well, the moment the elections ended, we approached India, no response. But then we discovered they were trying to push us in the fat of blacklist to bankrupt us. That's when we realized there was an agenda. And that agenda became obvious on the 5th August when India went against 11 United Nations Security Council resolutions which say that the people Kashmir is a disputed territory, and the people of Kashmir have the right of self-determination. They went against that. They went against Simla Accord, which is about bilateral, uh, sorting out our differences through bilateral means, went against that. They actually went against the Indian Constitution. Illegally, they revoked Article 370, which gave Kashmir the special status. They got an extra 180,000 troops there. Total number of security forces in Kashmir now are 900,000. And they put 8 million people of Kashmir under curfew. <laughs> Mr. President, now I just briefly want to make you make the people understand how can anyone do something like this? And for that, I have to explain to you what is RSS. RSS, Mr. Narendra Modi is a life member of RSS. RSS was an organization that was inspired by Adolf Hitler and Mussolini, came about in 1925. They believed in racial purity, racial superiority. They also believed they were an Aryan race like the Nazi believed they were an Aryan race. All that I'm saying can be verified. This is the time of information revolution. You can Google all this, what I'm saying. But it is very important for me to explain this to you so you know what is happening in India. This RSS believed in the ethnic cleansing of Muslims from India. 
the, at one point there was racial superiority of the Hindu race. Secondly, it was hatred for the Muslims and for the Christians because they believed that this golden age of Hindu civilization was stopped because of Muslim rule centuries back and then the British rule of India. So it was racial superiority and hatred for Muslims and Christians. This is openly stated. You look at the, the founding fathers of RSS, Golwakar and uh, Savarskar. Just Google them and you'll find out. And this, this ideology of hate is, is what murdered the great Mahatma Gandhi in 1948. It was this ideology of hate that made Narendra Modi in 2002 do a pogrom against Muslims in Gujarat when he, he was the chief minister. He allowed three days for these RSS, these RSS goons who were inspired by the Hitler brown shirts. They actually wear brown shirts. The, this RSS, the previous, the Congress Home Minister, the Congress Home Minister gave a statement that in RSS camps, terrorists are being trained. And these terrorists butchered 2,000 Muslims and 150,000 Muslims were made homeless. Narendra Modi could not travel to the US because of that. And I need to make you understand this background before I explain to you that what sort of a mindset would lay siege to 8 million people with 900,000 troops? Women, children, sick people, locked in as animals. In fact, of what I know of England, if 8 million animals were locked in, the RSPCA would have made a lot of noise about it. These are human beings. <laughs> and Mr. President, what comes with racial superiority, these illusions of Aryan superior race, is arrogance. The two go together. And it's arrogance that makes people make mistakes and do stupid things, cruel things like what Narendra Modi has done. It's sheer arrogance. And it's arrogance that has blinded him from the fact that what is going to happen when the curfew is lifted? Has he thought about it? This hasn't been thought through. What is he going to do when he lifts the curfew? Does he think that people of Kashmir will quietly accept the status quo because the, India has changed the constitution and taken away the special status, they'll accept that? Mr. President, 100,000 Kashmiris have died in the past 30 years because they were denied the right given by the United Nations, the right for self-determination. 100,000 have died and 11,000 women have been raped. There are two human rights, United Nations human rights reports on this. The world hasn't done anything because India is a huge market, 1.2 billion people. Sadly, the material prevails over the human. But this has serious consequences. Again, I repeat, that's why I'm here. Look, what is going to happen when the curfew is lifted, will be a bloodbath. The people will come out. There are 900,000 troops there. They haven't come to, as Narendra Modi says, he's done this too, for prosperity of Kashmir. This is supposed to be for the development. These 900,000 troops, what are they going to do when, the demo, when they come out? There'll be a bloodbath. Has he thought it through what happens then? Mr. President, has anyone thought 
that what happens when there is a bloodbath? What do you think the impact will have on people of Kashmir? What do you think they will think the way they have been boxed in, in their houses, treated like worse than animals, no rights, thousands of all the political leadership have, has been arrested, taken out of Kashmir. Even those Kashmiri leaders who were pro-India have been taken out. 13,000 boys have been picked up and taken to God knows which destinations. So what do they think? What, what, what will the people of Kashmir do when they lift the curfew? They will be out in the streets. And what will these soldiers do? They will shoot them. They've already used pellet guns, blinded young boys. In the last six years, the, the five years, the oppression that has gone on in Kashmir. And so Kashmiris will be further radicalized. Mr. President, there will be another Palwama. And guess what? India will blame us. They're already blaming us. They're saying this, all this is happening because of Pakistan. One of their uh, defense ministers said there are 500 terrorists lined up on the border to go in. Why would Pakistan send 500 terrorists when there are 900,000 troops? They, what impact are they going to make? What will they do? And why would? Don't we know that the moment there is some terrorist attack, all that will happen is there'll be further cruelty and oppression of the people of Kashmir. We will just give the 900,000 troops to further crush the people of Kashmir. And then we'll give the Indian government an excuse that, look, Pakistan is a terrorist state, and this mantra that has gone on, Islamic terrorism. The moment you use this, this catchword, Islamic terrorism, the whole world turns away. No one talks about human rights. You can do whatever you want, which is what has happened in Kashmir, because they keep using this word, Islamic terrorism. And this is what they're doing right now. What do we benefit from, from uh, 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 further increasing the cruelty on the people of Kashmir? And, and, and why would we want this? But there is no other narrative left for India. As, as when they lift the curfew, whatever happens, Pakistan will be blamed. And there is always a danger of another Palwama. They will again, they might come and bomb us again. And then another cycle might start. And what does Narendra Modi think? That 180 million Muslims of India are thinking right now. Aren't they watching these Kashmiris stuck inside like in, uh, for 55 days they've been stuck in? Aren't they watching? What do you think? Don't you think that the Muslims will be radicalized in India? And I'm talking about 180 million people. And when they get radicalized, there will be some incident in India somewhere down the line. Again, we will be blamed. And I'm warning you right now, again, we will be blamed. And, Mr. President, what about 1.3 billion Muslims who are watching this? And they know that it is only happening in Kashmir because they are Kashmiri Muslims. This is not happening to Kashmiri Hindus. They know that this is happening because of their religion. So what do you think they will be thinking? What do you think the Jewish community would think if, the, if they were, forget, 8 million, 8,000 8, Jews stuck like this. What do you think Europeans would think? What, what do we think? I mean, any human community, if their members are stuck like that, what, what do you think they will think? Are we a, a children of a lesser God? Is it not going to cause us pain? And then, and then, and then I'll tell you what will happen. People will, in the 1.3 billion Muslims, someone will pick up arms. I know we've been brought up with films, Western films. This good, decent guy doesn't get justice. 
he decides to pick up a gun and start seeking justice. There was a film made in New York, famous film called Death Wish. This guy gets mugged by his, uh, and his family, uh, his wife gets killed or something. He can't get justice. He pick, picks up a gun and he goes around shooting muggers. And the whole cinema cheers him on. So what do you think the Muslims are thinking right now? If there is a bloodbath, there will be Muslims becoming radicals, not because of Islam, but because of what they will see, that there's no justice when it comes to Muslims. There were Rohingya Muslims, my, Myanmar, who, was, who are, God knows, almost a million people out, ethnic cleansing. What was the response of the world community? So what do you think will be the response of 1.3 billion Muslims? I picture myself. I'm in Kashmir. I've been locked up for 55 days. I have heard about, and there are rapes, Indian army going into homes, soldiers. I, would, I, would I want to live this humiliation? Would I want to live like that? I would pick up a gun. You're forcing people. You are forcing people into radicalization. When people lose the will to live, what is there to live for? And this is what, if you can do this to human beings, you are actually radicalizing people. And so, uh, Mr. President, I, I want to repeat here, this is one of the most critical times. There will be a reaction to this. Pakistan will be blamed. Two nuclear armed countries will come face to face like we came in February. And before we head in that direction, the United Nations has a responsibility. This is why. This is why the United Nations came into being in 1945. You were supposed to stop this happening. I feel we are back to 1939, Munich. Czechoslovakia has been taken, annexed. What is the world community going to do? Is it going to appease a market of 1.2 billion, or is it going to stand up for justice and humanity? If, if this goes wrong, you hope for the best, but be prepared for the worst. If a conventional war starts between the two countries, Mr. President, if a conventional war starts and it could, anything could happen, but supposing a country seven times smaller than its neighbor is faced with the choice, either you surrender or you fight for your freedom till death, what will we do? I ask myself this question. And my belief is, la, 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 there is no God but one. And we will fight. And when, and when, and when, and when a nuclear armed country fights to the end, it will have consequences far beyond the borders. It will have consequences for the world, which is why I repeat I'm here. Because I'm warning you, it's not a threat, it's a fair worry that where are we headed? And it is, I've come here to tell the UN, you've got to, this is a test for the United Nations. You are the one who guaranteed the people of Kashmir the right of self-determination. <laughs> they are suffering because of that. And this is the time, this is the time not to appease like in 1939 appeasement took place. This is the time to take action. And number one action must be 
that India must lift this inhuman curfew, which has lasted for 55 days. It must free, it must free all political prisoners, and especially those 13,000 boys that have been picked up. Parents don't know where they've disappeared. And then the world community must give the people of Kashmir the right of self-determination. Thank you.